Alright, so we finished last time talking about Dumbledore, talking about, uh, talking to Lord Halifax, uh, talking about his ecumenical efforts, and now we will look at um, you know, someone with whom Ron Kali was friends, in his circle of acquaintances, and also we'll look at um, Bo uh, Bulgaria and Ron Kali's career in Bulgaria. This is on page 13 of the notes. All right, so Bulgaria and the quote-unquote Orthodox Church. So we'll explain soon, of course, uh, that Orthodox, neither Orthodox nor Church, neither of those terms actually applies to the sect in question. They are not members of the Church, of course, of which there was only one. Uh, neither are they Orthodox. That's just what they call themselves. So arriving in Bulgaria, Bishop Roncalli did not find an easy situation. The country, long ago evangelized by Rome, by Catholics, had first fallen under the influence of the schismatic Greeks of the Byzantine Empire, and then under the tyranny of the Turks. And so, it's true that uh, there were many, many centuries previous, uh, over a thousand years at this point, actually, the church has had uh, a certain presence in Bulgaria. Now, as we've seen now, there are not many Catholics, uh, all things considered, in Bulgaria, you know, even pre-Vatic in two numbers, anyway, those are small numbers, you know, some 60,000, 62,000 or so. Uh, that's a low number of Catholics in a nation. Uh, but it has definitely had problems. You know, the, it was under the, the rule of the schismatic Greeks of the Byzantine Empire, and then, of course, the Turks were, um, when they were uh, very militantly expanding their empire, they were extremely, uh, extremely fierce uh, fiercely militant in spreading the, uh, Islam everywhere, the influence of Islam, and uh, forcing people to embrace uh, Islam. Uh, so they were not nice to really anybody to whom they came into contact, you know, Catholics uh, uh, or any other, any other group calling itself Christian. They did not distinguish amongst them. They were all Christians who were to be destroyed or at least uh, subjugated and, and persecuted in various ways. <coughs> None of that is going to make for a good situation for the church to be strong, at least in, in numbers, in any place. So that is the situation in Bulgaria. Uh, the Russians made it a tributary principality of the Turks, but ruled by a Christian prince. And of course, we are at this point very much in the era of decline of the Turkish Empire. Uh, the, uh, eight, by the 1870s that we're looking at there, uh, in 1877, uh, Ferdinand of saxe coburg and Gotha was elected Prince of Bulgaria. So this is a Bulgaria that has formed, that is now independent in the wake of the recession of the Turkish Empire. Uh, Ferdinand was raised Catholic uh, in Vienna, uh, married to a, a Bourbon Parma. His son and heir, Boris, was born in 1894 and baptized according to the Catholic Rite. But the Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, should be in. H there, uh, threatened Ferdinand that he would not recognize him if he did not have his son Boris baptized in the, again, quote-unquote, orthodox religion. It was neither orthodox nor truly a religion either. And here you have uh, something from Nicholas II. He's usually, certainly nowadays, seen sympathetically. Yeah, he was someone who was a nice man, who was a family man who just ended up on, uh, in a difficult situation as the Tsar of Russia in a, in a difficult time, was, was murdered, and of course he was murdered. That does not, n none of his problems uh, by any means justify the, the murder of the revolutionaries, uh, uh, the, uh, of the, in fact, by revolutionaries of the entire royal family. But Nicholas II was... Uh, in fact, he's now a, a canonized saint, quote unquote, in the Russian Orthodox, you know, quote, uh, Orthodox in quotes, Russian Orthodox Church, Church also in quotes. Uh, his, in recent decades, the Romanovs have had something of a, of a reputation uh, rehabilitation <laughs> um, uh, century or so after the fact. That's, uh, uh, at the time, remember, Nicholas II was the scapegoat, and he even even acknowledged uh, taking on the role of scapegoat, that uh, they, 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 the country needs someone to go after for how badly things are going in the war and other ways as well. I'm willing to be that scapegoat, he said, in essence. So he was just really not the right man for the job. 
But even so, yes, that, that is the pr picture of him that is now most commonly perceived. He, he certainly was, there certainly have been uh, more tyrannical rulers in history than Nicholas II. There have been Russian czars who were w far worse than he was, but he was not without his problems. Clearly, he was himself a schismatic, and um, the, the czars of Russia actually always required that Catholics uh, in the country, that they, a Catholic priests, say only Mass according to the Roman Rite. And all the Catholics, Russian Catholics, were required to uh, attend, therefore, the, the Roman Rite of the Mass. So that, which means that to this day, such traditional Catholics as, as there are in Russia, and I'm not sure what numbers there might be, but whatever groups there are, they actually, they want always to have celibate clergy, the Roman Rite, because that's all they've known for a long time. The Tsars always wanted any Russian rites, some of which are, or at least could be approved by the church, uh, wanted that to be kept entirely uh, within the, the realm of the schismatics. They did not want there to be any Catholics, uh, any Catholic priests saying mass according to any Russian rite, even ones that might not have anything contrary to faith in them. And that therefore, the Catholic Church would permit, perhaps, them to use. The czars didn't want that. They said that that's only for schismatics, in essence. They would say only for the Orthodox. Uh, but no, uh, none of that for Catholics. So, just something to keep in mind here, Nicholas II really does not, uh, he's, he might be perceived as a nice family man in some ways, but he uh, definitely uh, did not treat the church nicely, and this is just one instance of that, pressuring the Tsar of, no, actually the, the Tsars of Bulgaria have that exact title, Tsar, as well. Uh, Nicholas II wanted, to, wanted Ferdinand to uh, have his son baptized again, in the Orthodox religion, quote unquote, uh, in order to, uh, that, wanting someone within his sphere of influence also to be a member of this same uh, heretical uh, schismatic, mainly first schismatic, really, as we can look at it, and also heretical sect. Otherwise, I don't want you. I'm not going to recognize you. So that is the problem that we have here. And again, we're talking here about uh, of a case in which uh, this, for one thing, just the first thing that comes to mind, uh, even uh, is that this. Well, for one thing, he's already validly baptized. I mean, going going into schism would be bad enough, but he's already validly baptized in any case. And this is a time long before all the problems we see with Novus Ordo baptism. This is at a time in which uh, all everyone who was a Catholic priest knew how to confer baptism validly. It'd be, it'd be, it'd be a very rare case to have a Catholic priest who did not know how to confer baptism in a way that was certainly valid. And did not understand the, just how important that was and did not actually do it. So that's, that's precisely why, prior to Vatican II, uh, just having a cert baptismal certificate issued by the pastor of a parish uh, was sufficient to have moral certitude that this or that person was doubtfully baptized. Because the, the clergy were well-trained, certainly enough to to confer baptism validly, but then also uh, they were very, there, was a, there was a great understanding of just how imperative that was, they were, and therefore the clergy were very solicitous of making sure that the sacraments were in fact validly conferred. So, that we're still in that time here. Clearly, late 19th century is well within that time. Uh, this is late 18, or mid-1890s at this point. So he wants, Nicholas, Nicholas II wants Ferdinand to have Boris baptized again, as a schismatic. So you have going into, <laughs> going into uh, abandoning the church, uh, both submission to the Roman pontiff and of course also the actual embracing of, of definite heresies, as well as also the grave sacrilege of baptizing again someone who is already baptized. So I have so, so many grave sins involved there, you have to count them all. So Ferdinand goes to Rome in 1896 to an effort to obtain this impossible authorization from Pope Leo XIII for the apostasy of his son. So imagine I'm going to go to the Pope for permission to go into apostasy, or to send someone else into apostasy in this case. Just imagine, imagine doing that. He, knew, he had to know what the answer would be. Uh, the audience with the Pope ended in a dramatic way, which was predictable. It went, went the way you would expect it to go, ending dramatically. Ferdinand, who had become king in 8, 1908, would have Boris rebaptized in quote unquote orthodoxy and would be excommunicated by the Pope. So, obviously, as you would expect, Pope Leo XIII says, no, obviously, no permission for that. And if, if you do that, you're excommunicated. And uh, that was that. 
So reasons of state, forced, he's not forced to do it. No one is ever compelled to sin, certainly not, uh, never ever, and most definitely not in such in so many grave ways. And you have to count the number of mortal sins involved in that action. Uh, forced, but he claims oh, I'm forced to do this for reasons of state. Yeah, no reasons of state, no, no reason ever could justify that, obviously. But that's why he does it, for those, because of a political pressure, in other words. I want to become the Tsar of Bulgaria, and I won't be allowed to be uh, the, the, the Tsar of, well, at least the Tsar of Russia won't recognize me as such if I don't do this. So he uh, considered himself forced, which is, of course, uh, may, uh, is, is false. Uh, he, was, he was not in any way, it was not as though he was, his hand was forced to sign a paper or something like that. Uh, he, he did this because of pressure. Uh, he raises his son, he educates his heir to the throne in orthodoxy, always in quotes, since nearly all of the country followed that religion. So they're, they're mostly all schismatics. They, they'd say they're Christians, but they're schismatics. He would deny being Catholics. So thus Roncalli became the first diplomat, or at least semi-official, of the Holy See in the service of an apostate Catholic court and a country which made its orthodox church the cement of national unity vis-a-vis -vis even Constantinople, from which the Bulgarian church had entered into schism. And so, yeah, say so in the manner of Constantinople, uh, with reference to that, yeah, remember that all of these schismatic sects in the East all sprang up uh, through an, uh, due to an excessive nationalism. Certainly Russia, the Russian Orthodox Church, is a, just a functionary of the state. And it has always been that way. Uh, that, and that remained true even during the, the, the communist era. That, uh, that's why we say uh, we had, and then before my time, but we had Russian seminarians who would say you cannot trust any sacraments coming from the Russian Orthodox. Even in principle, they have valid orders, that sect, but you can't trust them any in practice because the KGB would just send their people in, just put on robes and start doing ceremonies, and not, no, not even under, undergoing any kind of ordination. Those are the stories we were told. And, so, uh, and that's all just because it's a function of the state. That's what we call Caesaro papism. That is, uh, the, the Caesar or the, the civil ruler is the head of the church or, in some sense, the pope of that schismatic sect. So that's, uh, that is what we're looking at here. Caesaro papism due to an excessive nationalism. People who are so nationalistic that they want the church just to be part of the state. Caesaro papism. So it is altogether incomprehensible then that under such conditions a diplomat must necessarily move, or sorry, sorry, it is altogether comprehensible, it is understandable that under such conditions a diplomat must necessarily move with prudence and patience, but there are limits to everything, limits which Roncalli went beyond, most certainly. It is first of all necessary to have a clear idea, as we've been alluding to, that the so-called orthodox which separated from Rome under Patriarch Michael Cerularius in 1054 uh, after a first schism provoked in the 9th, 9th century by the usurper Photius. So Photius' schism actually didn't last all that long, but he was the first uh, major agitator of schism in Constantinople, and so uh, all schismatics, uh, Eastern schismatics, have come to be known by the title Photian. If you studied uh, the Ecclesia, or if you're familiar with the author at all, if, uh, there's, then you, you're well acquainted with the term Phocian. It comes up all the time. This is a general term for Eastern schismatics, Phocians. But uh, in the 9th century, that that first happened, was a Phocius causing problems, and then in the mid-11th century, uh, the, there have been uh, attempts, some of them even successful to a degree, to bring back the Eastern schismatics, but they always end up going back into schism. So 1054 is seen as the big break. Many Catholics, even among those faithful to tradition and consequently hostile to ecumenism towards Protestants, are particularly condescending in regard to the Orthodox, quote-unquote Orthodox. They are attracted by the beauty of their liturgy, the common cult, that's the veneration of the Holy Virgin, the saints, the images, a certain Orthodox traditionalism, the validity of their sacraments. Yes, this is a tendency you might see in some cases, of people saying that they're, they're traditional in many ways, and therefore maybe it's okay for us to go to them. Or even more so, or perhaps, perhaps they wouldn't draw that conclusion with regard to the schismatics, those who are 
uh, members of schismatic sects. But there is more a sense of this actually with re for some reason with regard to uh, those who were reunited to the church before Vatican II, but then went along with the Novus Ordo. There's a sense, oh, maybe, maybe we can go to them. Uh, maybe they don't name the Pope or supposed Pope in their, in their, in their, in their, uh, during their, the ceremonies of their masses. Maybe it's okay for us. Uh, you know, I'm not, not, I don't claim any great familiarity with that, but uh, from just from what little exposure I've had to such Eastern rites, it seems that they actually name the members of the, of the hierarchy of the church frequently, repeatedly throughout their ceremonies. So that's, as far as I know, uh, that's not even true, but it doesn't matter. They're part of the Novus Ordo religion, obviously. But for some reason, you come across people who start, who wonder about, oh, maybe we can go to uh, Novus Ordo Byzantines or something. They have valid sacraments. And yes, in principle, they do. But they also have had Vatican II type changes. Of course, they've swallowed the whole Vatican II religion ultimately, but uh, they've also had Novus Ordo type changes to their ceremonies. So, uh, yeah, I don't, not, not, don't claim to be an expert on any of that, but for one thing, I can, I can recall having seen myself, uh, there was, a, to put it simply, a Byzantine Novus Ordo priest who was doing his ceremonies in English. You know, they, perhaps they would not have used Latin traditionally, but they definitely wouldn't have used the vernacular. They would have used some, say, Old Slavonic or something like that, some language that might be called a dead language, that is to say, uh, not in use on the streets. That they would have some other, some other older form of perhaps one of the, perhaps the language they might be speaking, but an old, much older form of it, similar to the way that you know, Latin is the uh, perhaps more or less distantly related to modern Eastern languages, the way that Latin is related to modern day Romance languages, as they're called. But uh, in any case, that is a problem that you see. Well, this, is, this is Father Ricosa saying this, of course. We're drawing from his series of articles here. Uh, we're just uh, make, making these points, which were true when he wrote these articles in the, probably the early 90s, early 1990s. Um, it's still the case. You can still see this in certain people. Uh, so this is, yes, one problem. Uh, uh, less of, um, less of a, for, for, for some reason, a lower degree of comprehension of the problems of the schismatics and of also of really Novosordites, ultimately, who uh, are of Eastern rites. So all of these good things, well, in some sense good, are nevertheless only a memory of their ancient union with the one church of Jesus Christ, the Catholic Church. Of course, those valid sacraments are, in fact, sacrilegious. And any time they, of course, any mass offered in schism is a sacrilege, any sacrament uh, confected by the schismatics, even when the, those are valid. It's all sacrilegious, obviously. Of course, in itself, the validity of sacraments is a good thing, but it's, uh, uh, it is not true that because of that, that they are means of salvation. <laughs> As Vatican II teaches, that the Holy Ghost is not refused to use these, we would call heretical and schismatic sects, as, as means of salvation. And the, and the the way that the Novus Ordo conservatives explain this, oh, they have valid sacraments and things like that. That those valid sacraments are sinful for them to confect and receive, every single one of them, in, in principle. They might be some, that's abstracting from the fact that some might be in good faith. That is possible. But objectively, those are all gravely sinful. Anybody who knows the history of this and knows that he's just a member of a schismatic sect might be in denial about it, but ultimately knows it, uh, that is... Uh, uh, sacrilegious for, him to, for, for, for their clergy to say Mass, even validly, sacrilegious for them, for their clergy to confect the sacraments, of course, aside from, um, uh, even in the case of a, uh, of, of a Catholic who's dying, it is permissible to uh, receive absolution from even a, 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 a schismatic priest. Uh, yeah, but that, that's, that's under a different title. Let's uh, and enter into all the moral theology of that, but that is true, but it's to be somebody who's about to die. Uh, in that case, that person might uh, receive absolution from a schismatic, uh, but that is, uh, you know, ordinarily, to do that outside of it, somebody who's about to die, that's communicatio in sacris, <laughs> it's a very grave mortal sin. So, all of that is sacrilegious and it leads them to hell rather than to heaven. So all of these good things we said are only a memory of their ancient union with the Catholic Church. That whatever they have of those things, they've, they've stolen, in a sense, from the Church. 
They've uh, any any truths of the faith that they have, of course, they ha they know of from the Catholic Church. But as we've seen, or we'll, we'll see it actually just on the same page here and the next, uh, we'll see the number of things they deny, heresies they've fallen into, as a, as a result, whether direct or indirect, of their going into schism. So after the definitive rupture of 1054, yes, the unions realized by the councils of Lyon in 1274 and Florence in 1441 were effected, but sadly were only transitory. The disciplinary and dogmatic divergencies could only multiply following the anti-Roman stand taken by the Oriental dissidents. In 1895, the so-called Patriarch of Constantinople made a list of 10 Latin, that is to say, Catholic, supposed errors, which means something things taught by the Catholic Church or practices of the Church, including the procession of the Holy Ghost from the Father and the Son, filioque. So at one point, when the, there was a reunion with the schismatics, they were required to say three times, filioque, 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 stating unmistakably that no, we do actually believe that, that uh, truth of the faith, that, that uh, truth which is contained in divine revelation. So they deny that, schismatics deny that, yet just for the purpose of having some, some bone to pick with, with Rome, ultimately. When you look at this, the history of it, that was just, they started cooking up these issues. Oh, the West has all these dogmatic issues about the Trinity. They just started, started staying that in order to have pretext to break with the church. And of course, the, the accompanying addition of filioque to the creed, when you look at the history of that, which we'll do uh, at least within the next few years, uh, that uh, was a, a more complicated thing than might initially seem to be the case. There was some, yes, that was originally, there was a time when the filioque was not in the creed, and it started to be added in certain places without papal approval, and that was not so great that that was happening. Even if it's true, obviously, any addition to the creed, to the creed that is sung or recited during the Mass, that's something very serious, and there has to be papal approval of such a thing. And so uh, the schismatics started complaining about, oh, this is being done without, without the proper authorization in certain places. And then they also attached that, oh, but it's also false. <laughs> so they had some, their, their complaints had some plausibility, uh, at least up to a certain point. And after a while, it was established, no, this is true, it is heresy to deny, and it must be in the creed. Then they were gone after that, certainly by that point. Also, baptism by sprinkling or infusion. So there are different ways of, of baptizing. And uh, immersion is one of the ways, which was abandoned at a certain point that, uh, for practical reasons. You just imagine every time we were to have a, a conditional baptism, having to immerse somebody fully in the water. Let's imagine the practical aspects of that. <laughs> clearly, there are excellent reasons behind all the practices of the church. Having, be, being able to baptize somebody without having to immerse him entirely in water is a thing that is extremely useful. That is an extremely useful thing to not, not to have to observe in that sense. The practice of the church is, makes perfect sense in that way, uh, which, is, which always comes to light. And always you can see the, the immense wisdom of the church in all of her practices once you look at them, even just uh, with, with a minimum of consideration such as that, just considering purely the, the practical aspects, you can see the, the immense wisdom there. Also, unleavened bread as Eucharistic matter. So it's based on a, a misunderstanding of uh, certain verses of sacred scripture, of certain verses from the Gospels, that the schismatics think that our Lord used uh, leavened bread, which is valid matter, and the church can permit that, and does permit that on, on occasion for certain Eastern rites. But it's based on, ultimately on a misunderstanding of certain verses of the Gospels that lead them to think uh, that uh, our Lord used leavened bread rather than unleavened bread. And the church, the Catholic Church has known our Lord used unleavened bread, and that is what certainly the Roman rite is used in a Roman rite, obviously, but the church grants as a concession the use of leavened bread in certain areas. But, uh, but again, uh, the church clearly then does not say that that's invalid or in itself uh, somehow illicit, that the church can permit that. But the schismatics say that that's invalid and, and sinful to use unleavened bread because our Lord didn't use it. Yes? Well, it is certain that our Lord used unleavened bread. Yes, certainly according to all of the, the defenses of the practice of the church given by uh, Catholic commentators on sacred scripture, our Lord used unleavened bread. Yes. Yeah, they, it, had to, it has to do with the exact time at which the schismatics think that the Last Supper took place. 
and it's, which is that, that their opinion on that being based on a misunderstanding. Uh, they, they're, they're convinced that our Lord used unleavened bread, that leavened bread would not have been, unleavened bread would not have been possible at that point, therefore he used leavened bread. When you actually study it, that's not the case. But whatever might be the uh, case with regard to that. The schismatics accuse the church, or the Catholic church, of approving of sin in allowing the use of unleavened bread, which is absurd, obviously. So they also, they, the epiclesis, they insist, the schismatic insists that the epiclesis or invocation of the Holy Ghost, considered, uh, they consider that, they insist that that is necessary uh, to effect the consecration during the course of the Mass. So they have this idea that just having the essential matter and the essential form spoken by the celebration of the Mass, that that's not enough to effect the consecration, that you need also this invocation of the Holy Ghost. Now there are explanations for that, don't look for them. Uh, <laughs> it's not very well developed, their position on that, they just, that's just what they think. Yeah, that's understand that. In the East, there was never the same degree of speculative theology that there was in the West. Or they say, uh, say, that is to say, most of the Catholic Church. Uh, uh, definitely, there was nothing you know, approaching that among the schismatics. Uh, so they just, uh, they, they, they like to read certain things from the Fathers and then extrapolate from that, and then that's just what they think. So that, that's why, say, the Russian Orthodox, uh, uh, they deny purgatory, for example, but then they sometimes they'll start reading things in the Fathers that clearly indicate purgatory, the existence of purgatory. So, oh, man, we used to think not, but oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe we're, not, we're not so sure. And they'll clearly, they'll pray for the dead. You can say, ask His Excellency about that. Once, once or twice he went to Russia, and through clear indications that the Russian Orthodox pray for the dead. Now, why on earth would you do that if there was no such thing as purgatory? If, only, if, 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 if there's only two places for souls to go, heaven or hell of the damned, or I don't know what they might think, with regard to the limbo of the infants. But if, in other words, heaven or hell, uh, permanent states, if those are the only things that exist at, for a soul to go to after leaving this earth, then that means that there's no reason to pray for any soul that has left this earth. Souls that are in hell, whether, you know, I don't know what they think about the limbo of the infants, but certainly any soul that's in the hell of the damned, also any soul that's in the limbo of the infants, those cannot be helped. They are beyond help. Uh, they can never be removed from those states. So also any soul in heaven doesn't need help anymore. In fact, those are souls to whom we ought to pray for intercession. Uh, they're not souls who need our help. Uh, so the only possible explanation for praying for the dead is that there are souls that can be helped by it, who will, uh, who's, that is to say, souls in purgatory who will eventually be freed from purgatory. So that's the only possible explanation for that. But they, they deny that as well. Yeah, that, that's in that one of the next ones on the list. They deny purgatory, indulgences, and immediate retribution before the final judgment. That is to say, they deny the particular judgment for whatever reason. Uh, also, they hold that communion under one species is somehow evil. Now, it has happened in the history of the church that the church has required communion under both species on the part of everybody. And that was in the earlier centuries of the church when the, his when the heresy of Albigensianism, or it was really Manichaeism, actually Albigensianism brought it back, Manichaeism was a problem the Manichaeans held that wine was intrinsically evil. <laughs> Sounds a little bit Protestant, but <laughs> long before the Protestants came up with that idea, uh, well, it, not that the Protestants have any, any clear idea of what it, uh, what it is that something should be intrinsically evil, but that's effectively what they think. That's, what, uh, that's effectively their practice. Uh, but the, uh, the, the Manichaeans held that wine was intrinsically evil. And so, therefore, they held that transubstantiation could not possibly, therefore, take place under the species of wine. That God would not become present under the species of something intrinsically evil. And so the church said, no, transubstantiation does take place under the species of wine. Therefore, you must receive Holy Communion under both species to indicate that you don't think that transubstantiation does not occur under that species, under the species of wine. But later on, when Martin Luther and other types started saying that you must receive under both species for reception of Holy Communion to be valid, then the church said, no only under one species. Make sure you don't think that that is required. So there are other reasons as well. There are hygienic reasons, of course, in, in addition, reasons of practicality, reasons of reverence to the Blessed Sacrament itself, of course, most of all. But there are also even a profession of faith, how people receive Holy Communion. Uh, that can be a type of profession of faith, and in fact is. Uh, to this day, Protestants require receiving a, um, a wafer and grape juice or something. <laughs> for a Holy Communion. For the, that, that's their idea of Holy Communion. Of course, also, they deny the primacy of Rome. 
primacy of the uh, papal see and, of course, papal infallibility in addition. They deny all of that. And they might say that the Pope is truly, he might say, oh, he's the Bishop of Rome. He has true authority there, but he doesn't have the plenitude of jurisdiction over all the Church of Christ, of course, which is the Catholic Church. They, they, they deny that. So we can add on our side the permission given by the Orthodox for divorce. Indeed, they, they allow divorce and remarriage. So it's true that they, as we said mentioned before, that they retain certain truths of the faith, but as uh, the, growth, the, the author of the Ecclesiology book calls it, uh, that they have, uh, their, their dogmas have entered, uh, taken on a cadaverous form. In other words, it, it, their, what, what truths they have of the faith, uh, the state of it, of their belief in it, is something like uh, that of a cadaver to a living body. In other words, it's, it's something that was once alive with the virtue of faith here, but it's, it's corrupting that they're, that they, 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 you know, Clearly, all these things here, they, they've adopted various heresies, uh, denying, of course, papal infallibility as a heresy, uh, denying the procession of the Holy Ghost from the Father and the Son, heresies, uh, that, um, it, but they still would say that there's a, that there's a trinity, of, uh, the, that, the, that uh, there are three persons in, in God, in one God, no doubt. That they probably still at least say that. But again, it has entered, it's taken on a cadaverous form. Uh, being has been corrupted it's greatly. Clearly, it's dead. Uh, there is the virtue of faith is not there. And uh, also, Garrigou says that yes, that the that those schismatic sects that they have a, a certain stability, but it's the stability of death, which is absolutely true. Once you look at that, once you study just a little bit more closely, you see that that is definitely the case. All those those diagnoses are entirely accurate. So we, uh, the reader can easily ascertain that these divergences are not only of a disciplinary order, but also and especially dogmatic. So, yeah, cer certain aspects are, might say, at least primarily disciplinary, say, uh, receiving uh, communion under one species versus two. That's something, or using leaven, unleavened bread versus leavened bread. That is something that's... Um, uh, at least first disciplinary, again, this is not to say that, that the, the discipline of the church is ever divorced, that's ever somehow completely severed from their, her dogmatic teachings, her, her, her doctrines, but there are certain things that are primarily one or the other, that's primarily disciplinary. But most of all, yes, they, 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 they deny certain things that are clearly contained in divine revelation, which is the procession of the Holy Ghost from the Father and the Son, as from one principle. So, uh, the Orthodox, quote-unquote, are not then only... That's Father Rikos' exclamation point. Not only schismatic, as if to say, well, you could scarcely believe we're putting the, uh, the adverb only before schismatic. Uh, that's, that's a terrible thing in itself, but also heretical. So they're not orthodox in any sense. Orthodox means to hold to the Catholic faith, to adhere to divine revelation whole and entire. If before 1054, by opposition to other Oriental heretics, historians, and monophysites, for example, they merited the name orthodox, they can, there should be no longer, they can no longer honor themselves by this name which belongs only to Catholics. So yes, before 1054, there were many other heresies, and uh, yeah, those Catholics who refused to follow those heresies, of course, became known as the Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox. Those people in the East who actually adhere to the Catholic faith in the face of heresy. But now these, they've, they've retained the title, Eastern Schismatics have retained the title, uh, but have not only severed themselves from obedience to the apostolic see, but also to, uh, but also have uh, fallen into heresy, lost the virtue of faith. And they are not actually orthodox, that is to say, professing the true faith, but heterodox. So they should be called the Eastern Heterodox Schismatics. That's what they really ought to be called. Of course, we, only, we never refer to them as being the orthodox, that's just because that's the title that they've Hijack, something like referring to uh, Protestants as being, as, as being Christians in any sense at all. It's, anybody who might refer to them as that refers, refers to them as that, or any, any Catholic who understands the nature of things anyway, simply uses it as the label that they have usurped for themselves. So after this indispensable detail, we shall follow the ecumenical apprenticeship of Bishop Roncalli in Bulgaria, where he will learn the fundamental rules of ecumenism very poorly seen at the Vatican. The first of these being that 
it is not possible to hope to open a dialogue with condemnations. I will see exactly that, that he does not mean that in any, any good sense that might possibly be applied to that. He doesn't mean it by that. And we'll see that very clearly. So now the marriage of King Boris, the same Boris, remember, who was baptized in the uh, late 19th century. He's now, by the 1920s and 30s, is a fully grown man himself, seeking to get married, for, you know, it's, which is really imperative for a head of state, uh, the way that things were at the time. Uh, the king of Bulgaria uh, was born Catholic, but from the age of two years had been educated in the quote-unquote orthodox religion, uh, to please the Tsar of Russia, in whose shadow uh, Bulgaria exists. Well, actually, during the First World War, Bulgaria would end up joining the Central Powers, would end up aligning itself with uh, Germany, Austria, Turkey. It would become one of the central powers. It would be the last to join the war on that side. It's one of the, easily the least talked about of the central powers, though the last to join the fight and the first to leave. Uh, but they were indeed among the central powers. In 1930, the marriage of the king, who is by then 30 years old, and a Giovanna of Savoy, the daughter of Victor Emmanuel II, was being considered. So Victor Emmanuel II, remember, was the Victor Emmanuel who oversaw the final seizure of Rome. Victor Emmanuel III was a later king. This was Victor Emmanuel II, whose daughter he's marrying. Since the affianced professed, so affianced, those who were engaged to be married, professed two different religions, a dispensation from the Holy See was necessary in order to, to celebrate the nuptials. So here we have a case of uh, seeking dispensation from the impediment of mixed religion, it's called or religio mixta. Uh, this is, uh, there, the church has um, extensive rules, concern, extensive laws concerning the, the sacrament of matrimony. That is easily the most miserable sacrament to have to study, or a sacrament, uh, we'll put it this way, that is, causes the greatest misery to study because of such things. That's one of the things that makes it so miserable but to study. But uh, this is one, this is a case in point here of mixed religion. That's a two baptized persons uh, but one of whom is not a Catholic seeking to get married. Uh, so, in this case, yes, the, the dispensation of the Holy See must be sought. That is not an invalidating impediment the way that uh, disparity of cult is, as to say, a marriage, an attempt at marriage between a baptized Catholic, or at least somebody who was, was a, a baptized a Catholic may or not still be a member of the church, but a baptized Catholic, to put it simply, and an unbaptized person, that that is an invalid marriage by law of the church. So here you have the, the, the impediment of mixed religion, which is a different impediment. The, uh, again, it's prohibited. You know, the, the, because an impediment is not invalidating does not mean that those who disregard it are not sinning. In fact, it's a very grave sin to disregard uh, a prohibiting impediment. But this, rather than making the marriage invalid, makes it gravely illicit instead. So in order for there to be any chance that this marriage would be, could be licit, uh, dispensation is required. So the office of conducting the transaction fell to the representative of the Pope, our Roncalli. So Roncalli and being sent to Bulgaria as the representative of the church. Uh, an objectively very bad choice, though perhaps he was less well known than now. Uh, so the even, keep in mind though, even when the church does grant a dispensation for a mixed marriage, it's clear from everything that the church uh, does in, ca in, in carrying out that uh, marriage, uh, that the church clearly disapproves of it. There, the, the, there, there are no, there's no mass in connection with it, and the priest doesn't wear vestments. He just shows up in cassock. The ceremonies to be done, authors say, in the sacristy. It's not even to be done in the church itself, but right before it, the, the, uh, the priest who oversees it you know, gives an exhortation. Remember, you promised to raise the children Catholic. You've uh, you know, you're promised uh, not to, the non-Catholic party, you've promised not to try to induce the Catholic party to go into schism or heresy or whatever it is that, uh, which, of which you are a part. Uh, so make sure you honor those promises and now exchange vows and that's it. No blessing given or anything. The church clearly disapproves of this. It's clearly just a toleration even when it is tolerated, in fact, to avoid some greater evil or to bring about some greater good. The Canon 1060 very severely prohibits such mixed marriages, which, moreover, if they constitute a danger to the faith of the Catholic spouse and the children, they are forbidden by the divine law itself, at least with regard to lawfulness. 
I say it'd be very gravely sinful. It could be valid, but very gravely sinful for them to enter into. And you see clearly the severity of the, pro of the impediment uh, is an indication of just how strongly the church disapproves. Uh, mixed religion that is uh, prohibited because of the danger of the faith of the Catholic party. These are two baptized persons, one of whom is not a Catholic, what the other is, that's not good. Uh, it's very bad, in fact, but the church only say, prohibits that. But uh, say, if, if two people go into that pro and contract such a marriage without receiving the dispensation, that marriage is still valid. Gra they sinned very gravely in doing that, but it's still a valid marriage. So if they were to uh, uh, return to the state of grace, if, or one or the other were to, or pro hopefully both, of course, return to the state of grace, they would not, if they had it in the first place, uh, would not have to uh, have their marriage validated. That's valid. But two people, a baptized Catholic and an unbaptized person, attempt to contract a marriage without dispensation for disparity of cult, that's invalid. There's nothing there. If they reconcile with the church, uh, they have to get married after that. There's, there's nothing there. There's not even a case of an annulment in the case that they should separate. There's, there's nothing there from the beginning. There's nothing to annul. There's nothing ever established legally. So, uh, you know, annulments are a whole other thing, but the point is that that's a case of should they separate, there would, uh, there would be a, uh, separate from an invalid marriage, there would be no, no, no reason for an annulment. So that's a, that's a case which um, uh, is considered valid, invalid, um, invalid marriage, if invalidity is established simply on documentary evidence. That this, this is a marriage between, an attempt at marriage between a baptized Catholic and an unbaptized person, invalid. Nothing ever legally established. So yes, the, uh, before entering into a mixed marriage, the parties have to agree, have to pledge, have to promise, even swear, perhaps, that they, must, they will raise the children Catholic. And that's that. The church would never permit it under any other circumstances. Now, all, all, uh, the church could never even tolerate that. That's just a situation uh, in which souls are being born and going to hell. That's it. Uh, so there has to be, a, yes, uh, they have to promise that, they have to pledge that, and they have to, it has to be established that they will actually carry, uh, honor that pledge. And the uh, priest can only baptize those children that are then born to that marriage on the, uh, on, on the understanding that they will, in fact, that this, this will be, they will be raised Catholic. Uh, so the danger that the Catholic spouse or the children would lose the faith and embrace the non-Catholic, well, faith should be in quotes, religion, in some sense, can be avoided by having the non-Catholic make written promises that he will not attempt to convert, quote-unquote, the Catholic, and that he will have all the children who shall be born, baptized and educated in the Catholic Church, according to Canon 1061, and further, forbidding that the nuptials be celebrated or repeated before a non-Catholic minister. Not for any reason. Now, it can be tolerated in certain places that where the state does not recognize religious marriages that two Catholics, even, might have to go before a civil magistrate to be registered as married by the state, and at that point considered to be married by the state. But then afterwards, uh, the church does not recognize that they have to go and get married uh, before a Catholic priest uh, with the proper ceremonies. So that's something else that's tolerated by the church. In the mind of the church, you get married, Catholics get married before a Catholic priest, and that's it. That's it. Right, in a situation in which the state says, no, we marry people, uh, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter if you're a Catholic or not, then the church tolerates it, that those people could go before a civil magistrate to be just registered, and that's it. But that, uh, in the eyes of the church, that's it. That's just a civil recognition, uh, civil registering of people who are married. And, of course, at that point, before they actually go and get married in the church, uh, they're not even, you know, the church is that you're just registered as married by the state. That's it. You're not uh, married at all, not in any real sense. So the, the danger uh, from Sofia, that is the capital of Bulgaria, in this particular instance, all those promises came, yes, that the children will be raised Catholic, uh, that uh, the non-Catholic will not attempt to seduce the Catholic, the Catholic into embracing schism and, and heresy in this case. So all those promises came, and the Vatican granted the dispensation for the royal marriage, which was celebrated in Assisi on October 25th, 1930, according to the Catholic rite. But, as it turned out, all of those promises were empty, and the illusion did not last long. Moncali had scarcely had time to return to Bulgaria when the following day, October 31st, 1930, 
The royal couple repeated the nuptial ceremony in Sophia, according to the Orthodox rite, thus incurring excommunication, not de sententiae. So, one that goes, of course, automatically into effect. Of course, there are whole regulations concerning how that works, but in principle, yes, automatically. And Pius XI, just like Leo XIII in the past, was shocked. So Leo XIII was shocked when Ferdinand came to him asking for permission to send his son into, uh, into a schismatic sect. So Pius XI, and clearly, if the dispensation was granted, that means those promises, those pledges were believed. And now seeing that that, that that confidence was betrayed, Pius XI was shocked. On Christmas Eve, he denounced the royal couple who had given the most solemn promises and then gone back on their word. Roncalli, the apostolic visitor in Sofia, had to shoulder part of the blame for what had happened. Roncalli's biographer underlines the difference between the reactions of Pius XI and those of the future John XXIII. Um, again, he's highlighting this uh, in favor of Roncalli. Uh, he, he likes him. And we'll see that also, that there, Father Ricosa quotes other authors as well uh, who, uh, who like Roncalli, who like John XXIII, and uh, therefore portray him in a, or try to portray him in a positive light. But that's always when they see the very worst things about him. When they come, oh, see how, see how great he was, you know, contrast him to the mean pope at the time. And that's when you see, well, we'll actually see a, a contrast that makes him look, Mercalli look even worse than ever.